All right, ladies and gentlemen, today's lecture is on Etruscan art. And before the Italians, before the Romans, we have the Etruscans. And as their name suggests, they came from the Tuscany region of Italy. Now, during this age, Italy was not at all like we think about it today. Um, it was divided up between the Etruscans around the area of Tuscany, there were some Romans around the city of Rome, and then down in the southern part of Italy were actually Greek colonies. So it was a very diverse type of country. The Etruscans most likely stemmed from the Villanovans who occupied that area as far back as 2500 to 5000 BC. And feel free to stop the video at any time if you want to look more in depth at some of these images. So the Etruscans are going to be integrated into Roman society at the end of their civilization. Unfortunately, the art and architecture that they created was made with products we would deem as ephemeral meaning that they were only going to be surviving for a short time. They used wood, for instance, for the columns for their temples. They used a lot of tile and terracotta. They did use bronze. However, most of the bronze has been repurposed. And their language, while it's similar to Greek, is completely different, though. Um, and it's different enough to pose a problem to scholars. So we haven't fully yet deciphered their language. We do have writings on tombs and sculptures. I wrote down we don't have any literature. That's kind of a lie. We only have small fragments, but nothing that would be considered like a book, like the Iliad or Odyssey or Epic of Gilgamesh. Etruscan cities, they're laid out in a pretty simple pattern, and I don't have an image for it, but it's basically like an XY graph, and near the point where the X and Y lines meet, you would have that as the central focus of the city, that's the commercial area, the business area, and then surrounding that is all the residential. There is a video online that I gave you a link to that shows you a little bit more in depth about the language here that we're looking at. And the coolest things, at least to me, about this civilization is their temples. Now, an Etruscan temple is made completely different than a Greek temple is. A Greek temple is solid marble, but as we see with the, the Parthenon here at the right. But with the Etruscan temple at the left, we have a very large patio area, uh, a porch area, and then we have three interior rooms. The top of the temple is created with wood, covered then by tile, and then you've got these really awesome sculptures on top. And so here we're going to be looking at some of the ideas of what we think these looked like. All that we have really surviving from these are the original pads that the temple was set on. We do have some Roman writings that let us know what these truly looked like. And I've already told you about this information here. Think of also, there's just a single flight of stairs going up toward these, um, toward these temples. And it's not at all like the full facing of stairs that we see with the Greek temples. They also share the same gods as the Greeks. The medium for these structures, at least for the walls, is mud brick. I had mentioned that the columns were made of wood and the wood then was used to cover the roof and then that would be in turn covered by tile. Now this is one of the sculptures that was originally on a roof of a temple and from the city and temple of Vei 
is this Apollo figure. And it was found in around 1916. It's one of the few sculptures that have ever been found intact. You can imagine with terracotta how easily it would have been broken. This was originally painted and it is life size. In fact, probably a little bit larger than true life size. We'll see that with the eyes of this figure, with the mouth, it's very similar to the Greek Koros sculptures. It's got that archaic smile to it. And when we look back at the Greek civilization, we see that the Etruscans kind of follow along in that same aspect, orientalizing period, archaic, classical, and then Hellenistic. There is a really cool idea of motion with this sculpture. We can see that we have one leg uh, vigorously in front of the other as if he was moving swiftly, not just a, a little step, but a, a much more active step forward. And here's a, a great comparison with the Koru sculpture. And with even this one, the Kore of Ionian dress, we can see that the, the facial features are almost exactly the same. We have a few bronze sculptures that we do have left over from the Etruscan age. The one on the lower left is really awesome. It almost looks like an Art Deco period sculpture. Now we're gonna take a look at a few of the Etruscan cemeteries and the Etruscan beliefs of an afterlife were very much a hybrid between both the Greek and the Egyptian beliefs. Etruscans and Greeks believed in cremation, and Etruscans and Egyptians also believed that tombs were important, that they were homes for the dead, and they should also be stocked with all the things that the dead would need to survive in the afterlife. The tombs were basically mounds in the ground, kind of like beehive tombs, called tumulis. And I've got another video on our uh, Canvas platform that will give you a link to looking at these more independently. But they're really cool. They're mostly buried in the ground and then mounded up with sod on top. And there were streets through these basically necropolises and they're just incredibly cool when we go within some of these features. So again, kind of like a beehive tomb in, as far as structure is concerned. We have some of them with chairs. Uh, just to the left of the chairs, you can see that there are beds laid out. This is the famous Tomb of the Reliefs, where you have relief sculpture literally on every surface of Things like pots, pans, axes, knives, ropes, vessels, anything at all that a person would need in the afterlife. And right behind, uh, in the center, at the very back of this tomb, we kind of see that three-headed dog, Cerebus, guarding the gates of the underworld. So a really cool group of sculpture here. Now, the term fresco has never been used to really talk about Etruscan art. Fresco is very much Aegean, it's very much Greek, but here we just think that the artist painted on plaster that happened to be wet. You can imagine being in a room like this that probably the plaster had a much longer time in terms of drying and it never quite dried completely when before it was painted. One of the most famous works from the Etruscan age is the sarcophagus with reclining couple. And again, this is a, a sculpture made from terracotta. And when you see people reclining like this, they are eating. Normally, 
you would eat in a reclined fashion. And inside the sarcophagus, there was a cinerary jar that held ashes. And we're unsure if it was just one person's ashes or perhaps both of these individuals. Uh, again, we can see the very archaic smile and almond-shaped eyes. Uh, but these people are, are very lively. They're, in fact, perhaps welcoming our presence. And the woman most likely would have been holding an egg, which is, again, has some iconic or iconography uh, features about the afterlife. This is also called the sarcophagus of the spouses. And here are a few other examples of sarcophagi from that age. When we look at Etruscan women, they definitely were treated a lot better than their counterparts in Greece. Um, women there were rarely allowed to leave the home and were very much excluded from social life. But Etruscan women, we see had a, a very much more independent uh, lifestyle. They had freedom, they could attend sporting events, they could attend school, they were very much part of the family unit. The Capitoline Wolf is a, a really unique work because it was very much Etruscan. However, the figures underneath, and we always see these as, as one complete artwork, weren't carved until the 15th century. So these individuals, Romulus and Remus, which this work is all about the founding of Rome and how the children were abandoned and then they were nursed by a she-wolf um, and then they're going to end up founding the city of Rome and the Roman Empire. But again, just the figure of the she-wolf is Etruscan. And one of the few bronze sculptures we have left over from that time period. Now the last work we're gonna look at is Aulus Metellus which we know his name because it is carved in Etruscan script at the very lower part of his toga. And when we see someone dressed up in a toga, we automatically give them a higher ranking because this is not something you could wear doing manual labor. So we do call him the orator. Uh, he looks as if he's out giving a speech. It is a life-size sculpture. It is made of bronze and very much done at the end of the Etruscan age as they're being assimilated into Roman culture. This person is dressed as a Roman. And here we have a close-up of the Etruscan script that is in the lower portion of the toga. And that is going to end our lecture on Etruscan art.